none of us are far removed from this uh, shame and guilt topic. It, it's something that we've all experienced. So I just wanted to normalize the reality that this is a common human dynamic. And I think one trick that either our minds can play on us or that the enemy can play on us is to make us feel like we're the only one. And I think that's part of the setup for shame, the isolation, the intimidation, and just feeling like no one else in the world could possibly uh, be okay with me because I'm not even okay with me. So let's start off first, let's define shame and then let's talk about how does it play out? How do we recognize some of those thoughts or some of the reactions that we're having in life where, okay, this is shame? Because we're also talking about guilt and shame and guilt are not one and the same. Yeah, yeah, So really what good. do you think, Jim? Well, I say, and you've heard me say this, that shame, I say, stands for S-H-A-M-E, self-hatred at my expense. It's always about condemnation literally condemning myself. And there's a message, which we're gonna get into another episode of Shame Scripts, but there's a message that something is, is clearly defective in me. Mm -hmm. Something is wrong as we get to guilt. It has been said well that guilt is, you know, I've done something wrong. There's healthy guilt, which we'll get into later. But shame is, I am someone wrong. Okay, say the acronym one more time, because I love to take notes yeah. during the podcast, and I just need a refresher really I, quick. I just say that shame, S-H-A-M-E, stands for self Hatred, I hate myself. There's the condemnation. Self-hatred at my expense because it cost me. It cost me of myself, it cost me in my relationship with others, and it will cost me certainly in my relationship with God. And Romans 8, 1 tells us, there's therefore now no shame, if you will, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And experientially, if I'm in shame, walking in shame, not that I've lost my salvation, don't worry to our resident theologian, but experientially or functionally, I've kind of stepped outside of Christ Jesus for a moment. It's like I'm not walking with Him, because walking with Him, there is no condemnation. So self-hatred, I hate myself, and it costs me a lot at my expense. It costs me a lot, quite frankly. So good. Yeah, so and good. I've often said, um, I think I talked about this in my book, Uninvited, which is primarily a book about rejection when you feel left out, less than, and lonely. Mm -hmm. And something that I became aware of is that a lot of times something will happen to me and or I will make a choice. And from that, I develop a line that I say inside of my head. And that line, eventually, if unattended to, mm -hmm. turns into a label that I put on myself. Right. So you were saying shame isn't just that we've done something wrong, but it's, it's us determining we are something wrong. So then the line that either someone else spoke over me or I have this perception and I've spoken it over myself, that line turns into a label, then that label very quickly turns into a lie that I believe. And I find myself really turning more to the lie rather than turning to the truth. And I want God's words to be the words that become the story of my life, not this lie that I believe because of a line that was spoken over me that I labeled myself with. So the lie turns into a label, uh, or the, the line turns into a label, turns into a lie, and that lie then turns into a liability. Totally. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is kind of the way for me that it starts to play out. And when I say a liability, it turns into a liability not just of holding things that hold me back, but also liability in my relationships yeah. and liability even in my relationship with God. Yeah. So, okay, so we know now the difference between shame and guilt, but how does it play out for you, Joel? Like what starts to happen that you're able to identify, ooh, that's shame? Yeah, I think one of the big things that happens for me is when I begin to think about my own immediate consequences, like when I think about shame. Um, and then I, to Jim's point, I get to self-hatred, I get to self-condemnation, um, I begin to live my own brain and my own echo chamber uh, of all the things that I have done yeah. wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and I begin to tell these stories about myself. And almost it turns into an over-exaggeration of myself, not in the way that God sees me, 
but I would say in the way that the enemy sees me and in the way that is uh, exalted by our fallen nature. So what's really interesting is that I think both of you have said four words, uh, and there's a fifth kind of idea. So we've talked about um, guilt, we've talked about shame, we've talked about conviction, and we've talked about condemnation. Um, and the- theologically, like once we introduce the theology concept here, I would just suggest that um, guilt and conviction are actually really two godly, theologically appropriate responses. Genesis 1 and 2 tell us that you and I were created in the likeness and image of God. So I want to go to identity here. Um, What does it mean that we were created in the likeness and image of God? In the ancient Near East, so this is like Mesopotamia and uh, the Canaanites and and all those ancient people. And hold on, because, you know, Joel is about to get in his feels (laughs) right here, y'all. He is really, I mean, this is... This is why I like to work with Joel, because I'm like, no, I haven't actually ta- thought of Mesopotamia in a while, but, <laughs> but, but let's go there, because yeah. I know it's going to lead me somewhere good. So don't tune out right here. I yeah. want you to really get this, because it's going to be good. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Because we, we, we read a phrase like likeness and image, and we just bypass it so yeah. quickly, right? Mm-hmm. But it's rooted in a historical context, and the context is that when those words are being used at that time around those people, um, it was actually a reflection of a king and his children. So you would depict the likeness or the image of royalty with their children, and you would use those exact same words and phrases. So when Moses, who I think uh, is writing Genesis, says that Adam and Eve were created in the likeness and in the image of God, this is an identification of our sonship, of our daughtership, of the fact that we are made in the likeness and the image of the royal king of heaven and earth. And so this means the way that we think of ourselves should be through the lens of this theological truth, not what the enemy wants to step in and kind of um, bypass. And so this is just another really quick thought. If we, guilt is a good thing in the sense that it lets us know that this is not how it ought to be, right? Guilt left unattended, use that word, Lisa, guilt left unattended turns to shame. And it's the shame, it's in that sweet little spot between guilt and shame that I think the enemy loves to play. Mm. The same thing with conviction and condemnation. Conviction is a good, good thing. It reminds us that we have an area that we have to reorient ourselves Mm -hmm. to with God. However, if we don't act in response to the conviction, that little spot is where the enemy steps in and Mm -hmm. that turns into condemnation. Conviction and guilt are meant to cause our hearts to turn back to Yahweh, turn back to God. But guilt, uh, but shame and condemnation are tools used by the enemy to cause us to run away. 